This Film is Lit, the podcast where we finally settle the score on one simple question. Is the book really better than the movie? I'm Brian, and I have a film degree, so I watch the movie, but don't read the book. And I'm Katie. I have an English degree, so I do things the right way and read the book before we watch the movie. So prepare to be wowed by our expertise and charm as we dissect all of your favorite film adaptations and decide if the silver screen or the written word did it better. So turn it up, settle in, and get ready for spoilers, because this film is lit. Come along as we dissect the man who had no memory to forget. It's the born identity, and this film is lit. Hello, and welcome back to this film is lit, the podcast where we talk about movies that are based on books. We have another patron, Academy Award winning patron request this week. Getting into the born identity, but from the looks of it, quite a few people are excited to hear our opinions on this one. Uh, but yeah, we have a uh, the born identity this week. We have how many? Do we have all of our segments? No, no, no lost in adaptation, which I would have thought I might, but I felt like I actually. I was a little surprised that you didn't. There was nothing that stuck out to me as like an obvious like. Oh, I wonder. I mean, I guess I guess there could be, but I feel like some of my questions just fit into was that in the book, mm -hmm. which well, whatever. We'll get to it. I don't know why we're discussing this up front. Doesn't matter. So we don't have lost an adaptation, but we do have all the rest of our segments. So let's go ahead and get into our first one. Let me sum up. Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. The Born Identity by Robert Ludlum follows a mysterious man who was pulled from the ocean and seems to have completely lost his memory. However, he also appears to possess an unusual skill set, weapons, fighting, languages, disguise, etc. He discovers that his name is Jason Bourne and that a lot of very dangerous people want him dead, but he doesn't know why. Bourne runs around Europe, eventually joining forces with a Canadian woman named Marie, and together they uncover that he may be a feared international assassin named Kane, who is being pursued by another infamous assassin, Carlos. However, it is further revealed that Kane was an undercover identity created by the CIA operation that Bourne works for. Unfortunately, because his behavior has been so erratic, the CIA thinks that Bourne has gone rogue and are also now trying to kill him. In the end, Bourne almost succeeds in killing Carlos, but is unable to. The CIA now understands what happened, and as the book and the book ends with Bourne recovering from his fight with Carlos. And a lot of other stuff happens, like a lot, but that's basically it. <laughs> All right. So, Jab, the Born Identity of the film is about uh, Matt Damon, who wakes up in the ocean. Uh, he has a mysterious little thing in his arm that gives him a bank number. Uh, he's pulled out of the ocean by some fishermen. Uh, he's got a little thing in his arm that gives him a bank number. He doesn't remember anything, but he does remember certain skills and trades, like not tying or math or all these other things but he doesn't remember who he is he doesn't remember his history anything like that uh his name nothing uh he goes to this bank he finds uh some information in this bank uh the uh Safe safety deposit, deposit box. box um which has his information but then also has a bunch of like f uh alternative um passports and a bunch of money and guns and etc cool spy stuff uh he then realizes um, well, there's something going on with me. Uh, he runs into, uh, somebody starts, they start chasing him. He starts beating up a bunch of people cause he realizes he can also fight. Uh, and then he gets to, he gets in a big car chase. He meets this, uh, lovely German woman named Marie who helps him kind of get away. The two of them gallivant around Europe for, uh, a couple days as the CIA, uh, send a bunch of agents they activate all of their their agents in the field to go get jason Bourne, uh and they're all part of this organ this uh treadstone is the name of this group um it's like this program that jason Bourne is a spy in. we find out and then uh they all try to tra track him down uh, through the course of beating them up and murdering them he's able to figure out who he is and who's chasing him and why uh ultimately leading to a confrontation between himself and the leader of this 
Treadstone group, I guess it seems like. I can't remember that guy's name. Uh, Conklin. Conklin. I believe that's his it. name. Yeah. Uh, Conklin, uh, they have a confrontation. Sort of Conklin explains why, how he, where, why he lost his memory or what happened. Uh, he went into like a f- dissociative fugue state when he was on a mission to assassinate uh, an African um, dictator, but then his kids were there. And this, like, threw him for a loop, and he ended up not assassinating this guy. Uh, and then his memory, like, his brain broke, and he went into a fugue state because he got shot. Uh, and that's where the movie started. Um, and he remembers all of this, and he finally remembers who he is. And basically, I don't remember how it ends. He gets away, but, like, I don't remember. He he says that he's quitting. Yeah. He's quitting the CIA. Oh, so essentially what happens is he gets away, the the higher up above Conklin murders Conklin, kind of hide, they destroy, they like get, like basically they burn go, the like books. They scorched earth, yeah. Yeah, they burn the books on the whole program, pretend it, basically pretend it never happened, and then they start up a new program, assumingly doing the exact same thing. Uh, and Matt Damon is able to kind of skate away to Greece, it looks like, mm-hmm. and meets up with Marie, who now works, sells a, <laughs> or rents scooters in Greece, uh, and they live happily ever after until the next movie where she's murdered. The end. <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> wow. It happens in, like, the first five minutes of oh. the movie. It's wild. They not want memory. her in their second movie. I don't Jeez. know what happened, if that actress or what, or if they just felt, felt they really needed a new motivation for Bur- Born or something, because I don't remember anything about the plot of the second one, but she absolutely gets shot in the head in, like, the first ten minutes of the movie. Oh. It's wild. I remember seeing that in theaters and being like, oh, wait, what? <laughs> okay. Uh, anyways, uh, that's a rough storyline uh, for both the book and the film. So let's go ahead and play a round of Guess Who. Who are you? No one of consequence. I must know. Get used to disappointment. Okay. So we just have a couple of these. Most of the descriptions that were in the book, there were actually quite a few, but then none of those characters ended up being in the movie. Mm -hmm. So I just have a few. You are the prototype of the white Anglo-Saxon that people see every day on the better cricket fields or the tennis court. Those faces become almost indistinguishable from one another, don't they? The features properly in place, the teeth straight, the ears flat against the head, nothing out of balance, everything in position, and just a little bit soft. (laughs) I'm going to (laughs) assume that that is a description of Jason Bourne. Yeah, it is. That is incredible because if if you had, you, I don't think you could have paid someone like the most talented writer you know to write a more scathing like description of matt damon (laughs) than that like to the like it's almost prophetic in the sense of like who matt damon ended up playing this character because to me that exactly describes matt damon's looks other than his chin his chin is not soft it's very square yeah but like something especially younger matt damon i feel like he just yeah the cricket fields and just something and then the whole thing (laughs) what was the line uh Features properly in place, teeth straight, the ears flat against the head, nothing out of balance, everything in position, and just a little bit soft. Something about, because I, I, it's not in, entirely obvious what soft means in this context. Mm-hmm. Like, you could take it several ways, like maybe he has a little weight on him, or mm-hmm. you could take it like it's all, like nothing super well defined, like, you know, mm-hmm. soft in the sense of almost like kind of blurry or just kind of whatever. Um, and <laughs> I think... Matt Damon. So uh, it also just evokes like a a real like forgettable. Yeah, and like, he is supposed to be like kind of generic and forgettable, yeah. so he can like like because it goes on this this section of the book is really long, and it goes on to the guy who's talking is like change your hair or put on glasses or grow a mustache and all of a sudden you're a completely different man because yeah. your face is so boring yeah. and generic. Yeah. Yeah. I, like I said, I really do think that does fit Matt Damon because he's like, while a handsome man, he's not like one of like nobody. I feel like nobody talks about like he's never been the hundred most sexy men alive. Right. I feel like I Matt Damon know. could not have been super high on that list. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Even compared to like his buddy Ben Affleck, like I feel like 
he's just too generic to be. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Anyways. A woman in a dark red dress, the rich color of the silk complementing her long Titian hair, auburn hair. Hmm. Uh, dark red dress, rich color of silk complementing or rich color of the silk complementing her long Titian hair. Does that mean auburn hair? Yeah, okay. Titian is, it's like a dark reddish, goldish, okay. brownish color. Okay. Uh, I mean, I gotta imagine based on what you said, the only other, uh, about how like nobody was in the, the movie that was from the book other than these two, I would say this is probably Marie. Now she never wears a dress. She goes, she's much, she's much more of the like nineties. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's 2003, but much more of the late nineties, early two thousands. Like she's got a very like, mannish, grunge, manic, kind like of grunge girlfriend on, kind yeah. of thing that happened with a lot of like the, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a can. It's like adjacent to mannish manic pixie dream girl but like not quite the same thing yeah. you know what i mean yeah uh it's like that kind of look uh and i would say that it's her marie. yeah that is marie yeah cool yeah that's definitely a more a modernized version of this character i feel like like the the one in the dress is sounds more like a james bond character yeah <laughs> for yeah for sure all right two for two but they were pretty pretty easy let's go ahead and find out was that in the book Nicholas Flamel is the only known maker of the Philosopher's Stone. The what? Honestly, don't you two read? All right, so we open up. Uh, it's a in, in media res open. Uh, all opens are in media res unless we start at the Big Bang, to be fair. But I, <laughs> I always like I get the in, what in media res means, but I'm always like, you know, what? we're yeah, always like you're thinking about in it media too much. res, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> if life, it whatever doesn't matter. Um. But we open up in the movie. He's he's being uh, literally. We, we open up under the water. Mm-hmm. I think is the first shot, and we see his body floating in the water as like lightning and stuff goes off, and um, he's pulled from the ocean by some uh, fishermen. And I wanted to know if we open up with that same sort of just like immediately, like I said, in media res, not knowing what's going on, kind of open. The book does start in media res. It opens just ahead of where the movie opens though so the book starts with two men fighting on a boat out to sea during a storm we don't know who they are at this time okay um and one of them is shot and falls overboard and then i think the boat explodes was what happened Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the next like section in the book, we get kind of like a fade to black yeah. moment. And then the next section starts with some fishermen pulling a half dead guy out of the ocean. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, I, I'm sure you'll talk about it, but I, I think I like the movie version with mm-hmm. the, um, just starting in the water and not knowing at all mm-hmm. what, what led up to it. Um, and then getting that reveal at the end of the movie. Uh, next one. So after he gets pulled out of the ocean, uh, the fisherman is, I don't know why he, cuts him open here and why well he's taking the bullets out oh yeah but how does he and then he he sees like the scar i guess and it's just like wonder what might as well might as well well look it's like dude what if he like yeah what if it was nothing and was just like he got cut there when he was a kid you're just slicing in and looking around all right whatever um but he he slices in and he pulls out this little capsule looking thing uh that has like a blinking red light on top and he pushes a button on it and it projects a um an address on the wall mm-hmm. and we eventually will find out it's a german bank address or whatever wherever they're prague uh, which is switzerland zurich zurich not prague it's zurich which i believe is switzerland i yeah. believe is also switzerland um anyways uh he pulls it out and you know it's got this little cool little laser thing which was like the most spy gadgety thing yeah. in the movie um it, you know and so i want to know if that was from the book or if they added a little, one little piece of spy gadgetiness Pretty close. I would say that they added the spy gadgetiness. In the book, it's a piece of microfilm. Oh, okay. But it, it does have the same information. It has the, the same name of the Zurich Bank and then his account number. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, a, again, an update to the yeah. time. Yeah. Like, it, you know, doing something that... Also, just a much more visual... Instead of having him have him hold a microfiche up to the light <laughs> or whatever and, like, pull out his little jeweler's loop or something, <laughs> you can just, you know... Boop, put it on the wall and we immediately know what it is moving forward quite a bit he gets back to land he doesn't know what's going on and he just kind of crashes out on a park bench uh to sleep for the night because he doesn't have anywhere to go he doesn't know know anything about himself uh 
and he crashes on this park bench and he he gets woken up by a couple cops uh you know patrolling the park and they're like you got to get out of here and they start like hassling him and then he like goes into you know super spy mode and beats the shit out of these two guys uh and takes their gun um and before like disassembling it like all cool spies do does that happen does that i want to know if we have that moment of him like while he still doesn't know who he is at all just like kicking into like fight mode and being like what's going on what is my body doing you know what i mean yeah there is a very similar scene where he beats up some fishermen without realizing that he knew how to fight it's very different from what happens in the um in the book in the movie are yeah. very different yeah. it's something that i would put into better in the movie okay. um in the book he tries to spend a week working on a fishing boat and all of the other guys on board hate him uh and at one point it kind of like comes to a head and i think one of them pushes him or something like that and he defends himself but he does way more damage to these yeah. guys than they probably deserved and yeah. like now their families are gonna suffer because they won't be able to work for weeks yeah. so i think having him take out a couple of cops who are harassing homeless people is a better demonstration way of ahead his this skills. movie way ahead of its time <laughs> out here beating up shitty cops harassing uh people you know uh, temporarily homeless people and the sleeping on park benches um, I do also just, I mean, even apart from that, I do like the, uh, the sort of w- almost inversion of a, tro- I don't even know if it's an inversion of a trope where he gets picked up by this boat of, um, fishermen. And like, it seems like they all just kind of get along. Like, yeah, they just, like, like he becomes fine. part of the crew <laughs> and like you could, see, it would be very easy for there to be some weird tension or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. I just I like that. They just kind of like take him in and he just works on the boat for the next two weeks. Cause they're like, man, what else are you going to do? We'll just teach you how to fish. Um, I mean, I there's nowhere for him to go. <laughs> yeah. It just, it just kind of, yeah, no, yeah. There's nowhere for him to go and you might as well do something while you're here. It's just, I, that scene always made me chuckle. I remembered that this time, like I was like, oh, I forgot about this. That he just like works on this boat while yeah. they're, while they're sailing around, <laughs> and something about it I thought was like, kind of quaint. I don't know. Uh, so Born uh, was what we ultimately find out in the movie that Born his the reason he fell overboard and everything is that he was uh, uh, tasked with assassinating this uh, African dictator who the government had deposed. Mm-hmm. I don't know how much we'll get into the details, but the government, the CIA had deposed this African dictator and then or at least that's what it sounds like. And then um, he's been going around rabble rousing and like saying he's going to spill secrets about the CIA's involvement in Africa and all this sort of stuff. Um, and so they're going to have uh, Bourne assassinate him so he can't you know, yeah. talk or whatever. Uh, and that's the event that um, kicks off this whole shindig. And I wanted to know if it's the same sort of wider plot from the uh, book as it is in the movie no that element is not in the book at all so in the book jason Bourne, it it's complicated we'll say that he's basically like he was like special ops during the vietnam war basically Mm, mm -hmm. and at the point that the book begins he's been deep undercover for like three years and is posing as an international assassin named Kane to try and draw out a real international Hmm. assassin slash terrorist named Carlos. Interesting. I guess this is interesting or this, and I don't think I ask this, I I guess get kind of close a little later on, but it doesn't look like you answer it. Um, is there like a, a uh, an analogous program to Treadwell or what? Uh, Treadstone? Treadstone. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, it is Treadstone. Okay. In and the there book. and and it is so it is like this pro because it's oh, you almost made it sound like he was like part of the military or something. Um, is it the CIA or do we know? I think it. Yeah, it's like an offshoot of the CIA, but it's like super secret and even like within the government. I think even like within the CIA itself. Like, not a lot of people know about Treadstone 71. And that's the same thing in the movie. Like, it, it it feels like it's it's like a lesser, like a sort of more secretive type of operation going on within the CIA. Yeah. And not everybody knows but about it. Now, but. I could be wrong about this, but in the book, it seems like Treadstone is just focused on, like, this undercover mission of him trying to, like 
uncover this other assassin. Yeah, and not like multiple Yeah, and not like multiple operatives, okay. but it's like it's like a small group of people and they're just focused on his one undercover so, mission. So it's almost like Operation Treadwell, which is like it's like like an operation where they'll name you name, you know, whatever um I don't remember what any famous ones, but like a specific <laughs> operation, like we're we're going to capture this person. Yeah, kind of. Will be of. called Operation Blank or whatever. Yeah. And so maybe it's more like that and less like a program of like all these um, spies that they use for all kinds of different stuff. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. But it is called Treadstone 71 in the book. So okay. that's the same. Yeah. They, they drop the number, yeah. I think, in the movie. But um, I, I think it is really interesting then that they make it explicitly in the film, the CIA that's running this. Because I do, mm-hmm. I do think that we'll talk about thema- thematically what's going on in the film a little bit later. Because that was one of the things we kind of talked about in the prequel episode about kind of looking to see if there are more themes than I remembered when I watched this the first time. And we kind of ultimately come to the conclusion, eh, we'll see. Um, but... The one that is the most obvious is the government sort of um, doing shady shit, doing shady shit in (laughs) in foreign countries. And I think making the organization that he's a part of explicitly within the CIA definitely lends itself to um, a more uh, sort of. Uh, cogent satire or not satire um, criticism of the CIA specifically because the CIA is infamous for. Right. Going around and fucking with everybody's <laughs> government. Yeah, and that is something that's not present in the book. Yeah. Because, you know, this guy that they're after, he, it's not like they're trying to depose the leader of a country yeah. or, like, cover up the fact that they did right. that like they are in the movie. They he's, have seemingly noble goals seemingly, in the yeah. book. Like, he's, oh, let's get a terrorist. He's like, like yeah, a, he's like the biggest global terrorist. Yeah. That exists in the world of right. the book. So they're trying to like take him down. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely more, um, again, a surface level, more noble goals. Mm-hmm. Like you know, there's a lot to uh, get into there, but surface level, more noble goals than, than like we want to shut up some dictator who's going to tell people that yeah. we're being shady in Africa. Like, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, obviously a much more, uh, scathing indictment of the CIA in the movie. All right, uh, next one. So the bank safe deposit box, because i got to talk about this, because it's, it's a great prop. We talked about in the prequel that Adam Savage now owns not the actual um, safety deposit box, but the bag uh, and all the stuff that was in it. And maybe the safe deposit box. I don't know. And it's a great prop, and I want to know if he goes to the bank and gets this uh, safety deposit box full of all kinds of IDs and stuff, and it's that, and that's what first triggers, like, well, something is <laughs> something is very weird with me. Um, and... Secondly, does he then dump it into a sweet red velvet trash bag that he carries <laughs> around for the rest of the movie? Sadly, no. His bank account in the book is just full of money. Oh. I mean, it's like $4 million, which is cool for him. But, yeah, not as impactful as no. seeing, like, all of the different passports and everything. Again, something that I'd say is better in the movie if just for the visual impact of the scene and what it does and doesn't tell the audience. Yeah, absolutely. It tells you something's up, but not what's up. Yeah. <laughs> Which is the same thing it tells him. You get, you're learning along with him. I mean, if you, especially if you hadn't seen the trailer. Like, if you've never seen a trailer going in, you get to learn along with him. Like, what's up with this guy if you've seen the trailer it's very clear Mm -hmm. like oh he's a spy (laughs) or whatever but and no no sweet red bag no no obviously like doesn't put any money or anything in a sweet okay darn disappointed i kept yelling at him to ditch that bag yeah it's very obvious because it's a very like easy thing dead giveaway (laughs) yeah like change your bag out red shoulder bag get a nondescript bag sir yeah um, I had a note later, but it's just to mention makes it more sense to mention now. Did you notice at the end of the movie? Mm-hmm. The very end of the movie. It's it's such a great little detail that the movie had in there. Um end of the movie, he goes into the the scooter shop mm-hmm. and uh he, he meets Marie. Um if you look at the shot of Marie, which if you remember, he gave her the bag. Right, before At, before yeah. he left, or when she left to go hide or whatever, before he went to have his final showdown. He gave her the bag with a bunch of money in it. If you look in the shot with her in this little um, scooter shop, hanging from the ceiling, like, over the cash register is, a ho- like, a handmade planter with a flower in it, and it's made out of that bag. Oh, 
Oh, that's cute. Yeah, <laughs> it's like Adorable. it's like a little planter um, made out of the red bag. And I was like, I I don't know how I noticed that, but, but I was like, that's a good little detail, movie. Well done. Uh, does he wear? And this is very important. A sexy sailor sweater for most of the movie. Very sadly, he does not. <laughs> There's no mention of any sexy sailor sweaters in the book. Matt Damon was doing sexy sailor sweaters before it was cool. He was working that sexy sailor sweater. I liked it. Yeah, it's a great look. It's a great look. Um, he, he even kept it with the bullet. He's got bullet holes in the back <laughs> still, which is weird because he was in a wetsuit when he was shot. I don't wasn't think he? it's supposed to be bullet holes. I, I think it just has holes in it. OK, well, it's, it's like it's coincidence in that they happen to be very close to the places where the yeah. bullets because <laughs> I was like, wait, you weren't wearing that when you got shot. Maybe It's symbolism. It could be. Symbolism. I, yeah, I think you're right that maybe it's just a coincidence. It was like, yeah. oh, it's got it's an old ratty sweater. But yeah. I was like, it looks like it's got it's bullet an, holes. It's an old ratty sweater belonged to a sea captain. Of course, yeah, it has holes in it. Darn. No sexy sailor <laughs> sweater. Uh, does he, when he meets Marie, so he, he just kind of bumps into Marie in the, in the alleyway. She was in the bank earlier trying or to she get, she was a, in the embassy. Oh, the embassy. That's her, right. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Cause I thought he saw her at the and bank. He, oh yeah. He overhears her arguing with somebody at the embassy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then he meets, he sees her in the alley and he basically offers her a bunch of money. He knows she's needs money and he offers her a bunch of money to drive him to Paris cause mm-hmm. he doesn't have a way to get to Paris. Uh, and that's where he found out, um, one of his addresses is from mm-hmm. his ID or whatever. Uh, and I, and he just offers her like, I don't know, five or $10,000 or something to drive him to Paris. Uh, is that how he, is that the meet cute for, uh, Jason Bourne and Marie in the book? All right. So <laughs> oh, wow, I didn't think this would be a complicated one. So Marie is in the book as we covered earlier. She's a totally different character and the way that they meet and interact is pretty different, but I want to discuss that. At length, don't you worry. In another segment, because I do have a few different bullet points to go through as per the subject of Marie. Fantastic. (laughs) Put a pin in that one and look forward to that here uh, very, uh, very soon. Not in this segment, though, right? No. Okay, cool. (laughs) I have a feeling I know where it's going to be. All right. Do we have uh, we talked about in the prequel that he had to. Matt Damon did a lot of his own stunts, and mm-hmm. one of those stunts was climbing a building. And we, it's uh, very early in the movie. It's when he yeah. climbs out of the bank, um, and climbs out of the down, or the embassy. Has he already been to the bank at this point? Yeah. Okay, it feels like the same building to me for some reason. Like in one. And all, these. yeah, it, the, he goes to the embassy like right after he yeah. goes to the bank, so it does kind of run together. Yeah, I guess it just kind of comes together. Anyways, uh, and he has to climb down the outside of this building because the alarms are going off. They spotted him. He's trying to escape. Uh, and he scales down the outside of this building, and it's very impl- impressive climbing, and Matt Damon apparently did it all himself. And I wanted to know if he has to scale a building in the book or if the movie was just like, Matt Damon, you're climbing a building. There is no building scaling in the book. So somewhere along the line, somebody working on the movie was like, you know what I want to make Matt Damon do today? <laughs> Climb a building. Climb a building. Um would you say there are more, and, and you may have this in a later segment, but on on the, like, if you had to kind of on the whole it, would you say there is more or less action or the right amount or the same amount in the movie as compared to the book? Like action scenes, you know? Oh, what I, mean? I would like, say there's more action more in the in movie. The movie yeah. what, I mean, that's what I figured. Uh, but yeah, I just kind of wondered, like, are I assume there are, like, some action scenes. Yeah, there you know? are. Is there a car? Well, I have that question coming up in, <laughs> in like, literally just a second. After they realize Bourne's alive, Conklin, we cut back to Conklin at the CIA, and he's like, well, we thought he was dead off the boat, blah, 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 whatever. And he goes, well, activate everybody. We got to kill him. We got to yeah. take him out. And he says this line, which I remember, I think, from the trailer. Uh, I want Bourne in a body bag by sundown, which is a great line, a great action movie line. <laughs> Wanted to know if it came from the book or if that is truly an action movie line. I don't recall that exact line appearing anywhere in the book, but it does kind of match the mm. general mood of the book. Like you, you could give that line to a lot of different characters mm. okay. in this book, and it would work. It's a lot of like sort of machismo one-liner type of dialogue in the book. Eh, ish, yeah. Okay. No, I'm saying when I say a lot, I just mean it's 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 prevalent enough that there are characters that that could say that line. Yeah, you could get, yeah, you could give that line to somebody in this book. It would it would fit in. It would work. 
Uh, so I would imagine the answer to this question is no, based on what we discussed earlier. But I wanted to know if in the book the CIA or whatever organization is running uh, this is chasing down Bourne. If they activate a bunch of like sleeper agents all over from all over the world or all over Europe, at least uh, to come hunt down Jason Bourne, because it's it's a fun little montage. Yeah, I like that scene. It was fun. We introduce all these characters in their own like individual settings and they're all all not all two of them. No, really only one of them is played by a relevant actor. Um, mm. Clive Owen plays one of them. <laughs> one of the three. <laughs> I think there's three of them. Um, and Clive Owen plays one of them, but they're all like doing interesting things uh, while they're when they get their call. Is that what happens in the book? Do we have a sweet sleeper sleeper cells coming out of the woodwork to murder Jason Bourne? Uh, no, we don't have anything like that. Uh, the book is much like slower in that sense. We don't even catch up with anyone from like the government until like halfway through the book. Yeah. One important thing to note, Hmm. yeah, I think one important thing to note is that since the book takes place in the 70s, Mm. everyone is much less, like, interconnected, and information gets passed around way more slowly, whereas, like, you know, the movie is, what, 2002, 2003? Yeah, they're they're texting people. So, yeah, so, like, you know, the minute he pops up on a security camera yeah. they know it's him oh that's interesting yeah i didn't even think about that the setting difference because this is yeah like you said the 70s i didn't yeah. even consider that because things would have to happen incredible you know they've got satellites that they can pull up and <laughs> you know because i mean that's constantly they're like pulling up uh satellites and and uh yeah hacking or like cutting into security cameras and stuff like that to find them yeah, and yeah, they're able to text the the sleeper cell guys. They like open their phones and like text. Do you notice Clive Owen opens his phone sideways like a psychopath? Oh no, I think I feel I like that was that. a character choice by him <laughs> because he's like I'm a I'm a hitman. Like I'm I'm a, a I'm a sleeper cell. He literally opens it sideways and read. And I'm like, what is? It's so weird. Whatever. Maybe it was a phone that was designed to be done that way, but it didn't look like it. It looked like a normal yeah. flip phone. Yeah. That you just opened sideways. They all have the, these teeny tiny little like Nokia type. Nokia flip phones. Flip yeah. phones. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Oh, miss, we miss a good flip phone. <laughs> I had a slider. I had a the, slider for a while too. With the, yeah. with the full keyboard. Yeah. I loved the full keyboard just because my fingers didn't work on <laughs> the other like normal keys. Uh, so they're on the run. Uh, they end up uh, pulling off on the side of the road. Bourne's going to go. Do something. Find a trainer. I don't know. He's thinking about getting a train or something. He goes into a train station. I'm not even sure what he's doing there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He goes into a train station, um, but he he wants Marie to stay in the car. And he's, uh, she said, he's like, I'll go in. I'll be right back. And she says something about, uh, you won't forget me or something like that. And he turns to her and says, how could I forget you? You're the only person I know. This is an adorable line. And I wanted to know if it was from the book. It's not from the book. Very cute line, though. <laughs> 10 out of 10. Very adorable. Would not fit in the book, in my opinion. We don't have fun to early 2000 meet cute lines no. in, 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 in the Born Identity, the novel. No. <laughs> Written in the 70s. <laughs> uh, so when they get, they finally do get to his apartment in Paris. And uh, they're looking around, and he he's wor- he's worried that somebody's coming for him. And he walks over to a window because he thinks he hears somebody or something. And a guy, <laughs> a guy, I don't uh, repels through the door slash window. He just comes crashing, crashing through. through this glass window or door, uh, shooting a, a submachine gun <laughs> as he hits Bourne in the chest, and then he falls to the f- ground, and they start to fight, and. One, I want to know if that happens in the book, and then two, I want to talk about it. It's not in the book. Nobody okay. comes swinging through a window. This, they Okay, <laughs> this is the dumbest thing. No, it's not the dumbest thing in the movie. There's two dumb things in this movie. Otherwise, a very, like, grounded this sort is, of... This is, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. This is the second dumbest thing. This is the second thing. dumbest thing in the movie. Uh, the very grounded, like, sort of really, you know, kind of realistic movie otherwise. Um and not that this isn't realistic, but it's just so dumb because it's like he's a highly trained assassin there to kill Jason Bourne. The, are there to kill another highly trained assassin. Another highly assassin. trained assassin. And his plan is to swing through a window 
that he can't see through. It's not a clear window. Yeah, it's like frosted. It's frosted glass is to swing through this window whilst firing his machine gun randomly. <laughs> not shoot through the glass first. Just swing through it while shooting. And what? So if Jason Bourne wasn't standing right there, all j- now he's just announced his presence. <laughs> And he's ostensibly covered in cuts. And he's just covered in glass. And and so I guess the implication is that he could somehow see a little bit of like the outline of yeah, Bourne, like with the light or whatever, or the shadow something, or something. Yeah. So he knew he was there and then did it. But if he knew he was there, why didn't he just unload his fucking machine gun through? It's so stupid. You know and it's what? literally <laughs> just in the movie so that that dramatic moment, like that yeah. jump scare moment happens. Yeah. We don't know anything about that particular uh assassin, assassin yeah. we don't know his name or anything but i love him <laughs> because he is extra he's very extra he took his role as a super secret spy assassin and he's doing the most with it he really is he's 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 <laughs> This is the problem with video games. He played too many <laughs> video games in his life. <laughs> this is the real problem with video games. It's not it doesn't it doesn't cause violence or whatever. It's just when you do have somebody highly trained as a super assassin, they think they can get away with <laughs> repelling through windows whilst firing machine guns uh, to kill highly trained secret agents. So dumb. Could have just walked in into the apartment and shot him in the head probably without him yeah, even realizing. Probably. Uh, I know it's so stupid. In the ensuing fight, uh, this is a very well-known fight uh, where he kind of beats up this guy that, that has just crashed through the window. And at one point, the guy pulls out a little knife that he has in his boot. Um, and then uh, Bourne is like, Ugh, and he backs up to his desk and he pulls, grabs a uh, an ink pen, like a plastic ink pen off his desk. And then they knife fight with a knife and an ink pen. And he ends up stabbing this ink pen into the guy's, <laughs> yeah. like... Uh, like like under the, the skin and the of, like then the webbing between his fingers. Yeah, like, it's very like him, they picked the worst possible. Sp- pulls it out. Oh god! Uh, they picked the worst possible spot for him to stab this guy. Uh, one of the worst possible spots. Um, very terrifying and horrifying. Uh, and I wanted to know if it was in the book or if we have to blame the movie makers for watching this guy pull a pen out of his. We can blame the movie makers for this one because there is no pen stabbing. If there was, it was not notable to me. Yeah. No pen stabbing in the book. Okay. But I think I would have remembered that. Yes, I feel like you would have remembered that. Um, And I I realized in this one because I asked, I I made a joke in one of the earlier episodes about how what I was going to ask you about this was if he beats anybody up with a book. Yeah. And I'm realizing now that it must be one of the sequels. Mm-hmm. There's a yeah, 100% he a scene a where he beats somebody movie. up with a book or a magazine or something. And I, <laughs> But I'm like thinking it's in the sequel, The Born Supremacy. Yeah. Because in this one, that, I kept waiting. I feel like, because that's the thing people joke about all the time is he beats people up with stuff like random things he grabs. And the only thing time that happens in this one really is the, the Just pen. Just the pen, yeah. Like, at least that I can think of, at least in terms of, like, really notable things. He might grab, like, a, I don't know, a knife or something at some point. Uh, he does grab a knife, but he doesn't use it. He drops it yeah. on the floor. That's but right. as far as, like, non-weapon Yes, like, items. odd weapons, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the pen's the only one. But I think that's what it is. I think in the, they kept doing it because people, mm-hmm. like, reacted to that. And so, like, they're like, oh, it's got a book in the next one. Whatever. Um, <laughs> interesting. Does he beat anybody up with a book? Or in this <laughs> no. Book? Okay. <laughs> but you could beat someone up with that book. You could. It's uh, especially if it was a hardback. It's a brick. Even if it wasn't a hardback, yeah, you could, you could, whop somebody pretty yeah. good with that. Uh, so after this whole fight takes place, they get down to their car and they're on the run. Uh, well, mainly from the cops. I don't, I don't remember why. Yeah, the main, cops, yeah, mainly from the cops. I don't at this remember point. why the cops. Well, because he throws himself out the window. Oh, when that's he right. Fails to kill Born. He just like. Yeah, he kills himself. He kills himself. Yeah. He self-aborts the whole mission yep. and, like, flings himself out the window. So then there's a dead guy in the street. Yeah, and they, they, they're on the run from the cops, and uh, they, they're they in her Mini Cooper. She drives a Mini Cooper, and it's a sweet, epic car chase. And one, I guess the only question is, is there an epic, sweet car chase in a Mini Cooper? There is not a car chase <sighs> in a Mini Cooper or otherwise. They do drive... In the book, but, but there's no like, like no interesting chase. chases. Yeah, 
It's a good car chase in this one, and it is mm-hmm. a. Uh, it's a. It's funny. It came out the same year, I believe. Um, this is a the the Mini Cooper. I think specifically is a nod to it. It's like a 1969 British movie called the. Uh, Italian Job, mm. and um, there's a fa- a very famous uh, car chase in a Mini Cooper, and they remade the Italian Job with like Mark uh, Mark Wahlberg, and it came out like the <laughs> same year this movie did. But I think the Mini Cooper chase in this one is a like yeah. an homage to that, if I had to guess. Interesting, or the fact that it is a Mini Cooper. But anyways, uh, after they have this uh, epic car chase where Matt Damon drives real good. Uh, they, they gotta have a post car chase release and they, so they have sex. Does that happen in the book? I mean, there, there are sexy times in the book. Uh, again, this is something that I will be discussing later in conjunction with the changes made to Marie's character (laughs) and their relationship. But rest assured, they do have sex in the book. Oh, fantastic. Uh, so we finally get to the end of the movie, and we we f- we get the backstory of of what happened to Bourne before he went into his fugue state, mm-hmm. um, and he was on a mission to assassinate this, like I said, this African dictator on his own personal yacht. But when he gets there to assassinate him, he's sleeping with his kids. Basically, they're all like laying there, like sleeping, and the kids are and he and he, he sees the kids, and he's like, ah, can't kill you. Um, and I want to know if that is what triggers like the whole thing is this personal crisis from being on the mission and not being able to complete it because of the kids and having like a moral sort of crisis type of thing uh there's never any mention of him having a soft spot for kids in the book so okay so is so there and so in the movie or in sorry in the book there's not like any sort of he doesn't have like a moral crisis he just loses a fight and gets shot and then loses his memory we don't have that. We don't have that initial sort no. of character moment of, or of any type of him, or even if it's something different, like I said, than kids, or 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 even like a, a mortal crisis. Even if he had, it's just like he's he's there to kill this guy. They are in a fight, and then he loses and dies, or something, or gets shot and goes overboard. Yeah, basically. Okay. All right. I don't know if we ever even find out who he's fighting on the boat. <laughs> I. Interesting. The last, I'm, I'm going to be real, the last 70 pages of this book were a blur for me. <laughs> uh, and then my last question, the dumbest thing in this movie, after he, he gets his backstory explained, he's got to get out of this, um, he's still got to get out of this safe house that he broke in to confront Conklin in. Um, and there are these guys coming up from downstairs to come kill him. And he has already killed one guy. And then he, there's this guy running up the spiral staircase to get to him. And his plan that he comes up with is to to throw the first guy's that he killed's body over the railing so that it falls down the middle of this eight floor spiral yeah. staircase <laughs> while writes it, whilst riding on the back of it. And falling, he then shoots the guy who's running up the stairs in the head and then lands six, seven stories down and bounces off this body. And the body absorbs enough of the damage for him to get up and limp away. It's the dumbest thing in this movie. (laughs) It's the dumbest thing. And I want to know if it's in the book. It is not in the book, and you know what? I don't even know what to say about this one. Like, I am actually speechless. I I don't I don't know what to say about it. It's wild again for a movie so like, and especially compared like the the other one with the guy coming through the window doesn't even compare to this one and how ridiculous this is compared to the rest of the film. Like yeah. the rest of yeah. the film is so sort of grounded. And then he rides a he body rides eight a body floors. Like a magic fucking carpet eight floors down and then uses it like a bounce house to absorb his fall. Yeah. Which what? I, I, barring any of the like barring any of the <laughs> discussions of whether or not that would work and if he would survive and how hurt he would be. I'm not even worried about that. I'm just going to say, sure, maybe that would work. There's one guy on the stairs 
who's running up at him. Yeah. He has two guns that he's holding. Two and guns. He, two guns. And he's looking down. It's a spiral staircase. He's aiming down. He's going to have a much better angle. By the time this yeah. guy gets up to him, he's going to be able to shoot him. He has the high ground. He has the high ground and the angle on this guy. There's a 0% chance this guy is going to be able to shoot him before <laughs> he shoots that guy. And the and he goes, no, 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 that's not the best plan. The best plan is to fall past him and shoot him as I'm falling. That'll be a much easier deal. Maybe the flaw in the Treadstone Super Assassin programming is that they have like a glitch where they become really extra all of a sudden, <laughs> yeah, and make really bad theatrical decisions. They, yeah, they they're like that is the thing. Does Clive <laughs> Owen? Let's see what when Clive Owen dies, does he do anything? I'm trying to think. Not really. Not He's really. the one who's out in the field. He's the right? one in the field. Yeah, I don't, he's just I don't like a sniper, he and he yeah. like he's shooting at him, and then he misses. He does also die stupidly, <laughs> like he, he Matt because Damon he does, just he runs does a at very him. bad job of like being sneaky. Yeah, in that field he just ends once up he in a field. That yeah, Horn is there, but it, but it's not super theat- theatrical yeah. or anything. It's, it's just, just kind of yeah, it's kind of dumb. <laughs> yeah, but but oh my god, that that scene, I was like, I had forgotten about that. <laughs> And I was like taken aback at how stupid it was. I made an audible noise when that <laughs> happened, and I don't often do that when yeah. we watch movies. Yeah, it's wild. It's uh, it, yeah, because it is. I and that feels like it had to hundred percent have been a studio note of like <laughs> we need a big yeah action a we big a action big moment a big finish. This is the big final action scene. There's not anything after this. We got to have a big finish, and they're like. Somehow they came up with that, I guess. And maybe it's that they also needed him to be limping. Yeah. Just for the next little gag after that. Yeah. But anyways, ugh. Uh, I am going to have one more question, I just realized. But anyways, uh, so yeah, that that scene, not in the book, and boy, um, it's so, so dumb. My last question that I didn't write down, it should be easy, I guess. In the film... Uh, Conklin, who's been in charge of this whole thing and 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 uh, has been getting the shakedown from the higher ups in the CIA about this whole thing. At the end of it, he's also like our main antagonist. He's the one out there. Got to we got to kill Bourne. Um, is is there an equivalent character in the book? Um, yeah, there is actually. Um, and his name is Conklin. Oh, okay. Um, and now it's it's different. Um, because. They aren't trying to, like, cover anything up right. by killing him. So what happens in the book, essentially, is that this other assassin, Carlos, kills a bunch of the Treadstone 71 people mm-hmm. and, like, frames Bourne for it and, make like, makes it look like he did it. So then Conklin is, like, filled with righteous fury and, like, is going to go after born and like he's like i'll give him two minutes to say his piece and then i'm filling him full of lead (laughs) kind of thing yeah okay uh well then also i guess so my actual question i wanted to know if that character was or or similar character was in the book Mm -hmm. because i wanted to know if in the in the movie at the end conklin is assassinated by the cia because he messed this whole thing up and let Bourne get away and then failed to capture him and blah, 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 all this stuff. And so ultimately the CIA assassinates Conklin. I wanted to know if that's what happens in the book. Um, no. Or anything I, like No, that. I I believe Conklin lives. Or even if it's not Conklin or if there's anybody, yet, like if, if we get that similar like sort of inner, inner government cover up of them like killing somebody within the organization other other than Bourne to like cover up. Anyways, no. No, not okay. really. I mean, they they do shut down Treadstone yeah. at the end, but it doesn't seem like it's part of a cover up. And they didn't assassinate anybody as part of that cover up. No. Okay, <laughs> that that was my main question. All right, it's time now to find out what was better in the book. You like to read? Oh yes, I love to read. What do you like to read? Everything. So I have a, a couple things here, and I'm going to kind of hem and haw around my first point, but because it's it's different in the movie because they're trying to, like, cover something up, 
but in the book they like when Bourne resurfaces and they realize that he's like out there again I think it makes a lot of sense for them to automatically think that he's like gone rogue yeah because that is what they think because it's a much longer period of time it's six months Oh. That pass where he's like, he gets pulled out of the ocean and then he's recovering on this island for like six months. Yeah, it's only two weeks. Yeah, so he's he's been movie. a ghost for six months and then he goes to the bank and immediately transfers all of the millions out of his account into other accounts. So I think it totally makes sense yeah. in the book for yeah. them to be like, oh, he, we lost yep. him. Yeah, he's, he he's, went rogue. Yep, he's a bad guy now. Yeah. Um, which and they, they kind of. I think try to play it like that in the movie, but since they're trying to like cover stuff up, I think that makes it, it's different. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I also love that uh, Google Docs auto corrected. So this sentence says uh, they think that Bourne has gone rouge. Well, that might have been me. I don't know. <laughs> I might have just typoed He's that. He's gone rouge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was a scene that I liked pretty early in the book where he robs a rich guy at this little coastal French town before going to Zurich because he like, he needs money to get mm-hmm. to Zurich. He's like, where am I going to get money from? Um, so he he robs this rich guy and like, yes, busting in on a guy while he's naked and robbing him at gunpoint is bad, even if that guy is a rich asshole. Is it, though? <laughs> <laughs> but like, it was also one of the funniest and most entertaining things to happen in the book. Yeah. So I don't think it would fit in the movie. <laughs> no, but there's also a scene in the book after they get Marie's picture and they start kind of trying to like frame her not not really as an accomplice like they do in the movie but they try to like frame her for like a bank robbery basically Hmm. like for his millions of dollars going missing yeah and there's a there's a scene where they're in a cab and he's like muttering to her and telling her how to put her makeup on so that she'll look slightly different from the picture that they have and all of the newspapers. Hmm. And I feel like I really could have done with a scene where Matt Damon (laughs) (laughs) instructs um, Franca Patente Patente how to draw her eyebrows on (laughs) so that she'll look slightly different. (laughs) Just nothing, nothing like a, a scene where a dude mansplains makeup <laughs> to a woman. I mean, to be fair, he's a highly trained uh, like secret agent, so well, yeah, he's he, got he some makeup about tricks. Disguise. But, yeah. He's a master of disguise, <laughs> but it was just funny. Um, and I, I really could have, I could have done with that. Also funny in the book uh, when this, when we start on this scene, he. Born turns to Marie and he's like, "Do you have an eyebrow pencil in your bag?" And she's like. <laughs> Of course. (laughs) I am a lady. One of those little things that dates the book. (laughs) Yeah. Um, As well as dates the author. Yeah. Um, I probably should carry an eyebrow pencil in my bag because I do draw (laughs) on my eyebrows, but I don't. (laughs) So... If I if I ever find myself in cahoots with a super spy and he's like, do you have an eyebrow pencil? I'm going to have to be like, nope. nope. <laughs> <laughs> also on the subject of disguise, um, halfway through the book, Bourne dyes his hair blonde and wears fake glasses. And I think that they should have made Matt Damon bleach his hair halfway through the movie. And wear giant fake glasses. And wear giant fake, yeah, he wears giant fake tortoise shell glasses because it's the 70s. So, cowards. Yes, that would have been hilarious. I would have been, I would have been into that. (laughs) All right, let's go ahead and find out what Katie thought was better in the movie. My life has taught me one lesson, Hugo, and not the one I thought it would. Happy endings only happen in the movies. Okay, so my first little note, uh, I agree with you that I think starting with him in the water and not showing how he got there is a good change. I think that creates more intrigue and mystery than where the book starts. Mm Mm-hmm. And now let's talk about Marie. Let's talk about Marie. So I like the movie start to Jason and Marie way more than what happens in the book. 
let me break this down for you. Here's what happens in the book. Marie is an economist, and she works for the Canadian government. She happens to be at the hotel that Jason is staying at because she's there for a conference. He is trying to get out of the hotel without attracting the attention of some guys who are there to kill him. So he basically grabs her and kidnaps her and forces her to walk out of the hotel with him, reasoning that a couple leaving won't attract attention like a single man running out of the hotel will. Now, he initially tells her that he'll let her go as soon as they leave the hotel, but it doesn't go smoothly, and so he ends up forcing her to drive him around as well as leave the hotel with him. This is a very uh, 70s James Bond version of their meet. (laughs) And during that time, he also slaps her several times, threatens to kill her several times, (laughs) also does a nerve pressure thing so that she can't move her arm. She does get away from him at one point, um, but runs into the bad guys who are chasing him who tell her that they're the police. And then they send her away with another guy like, oh, he's going to take you down to the station. Jason realizes that they're going to kill her. So he goes after her, narrowly saves her from being raped by that guy. And then she falls in love with him. Wow. And I am not exaggerating the speed with which this 180 happens. Sexual assault happens on page 125. On page 127, she's tending his wounds and helping him into the car. And on page 149, which is just the next chapter, they're having sex for the first time. Nice. And I get that this book is dated. <laughs> like you, you, you don't need to come for me and be like, well, it's from the 70s. I get get it but that does not make this relationship progression okay he abducted her he assaulted her he threatened her and then stopped another guy from raping her that doesn't make him the good guy uh it makes him a slightly less bad guy uh every movie made prior to 1990 would have disagree with you Mm. i mean that doesn't make it that doesn't make (laughs) it fine that doesn't make it fine no absolutely not And to that note, I think Marie sticking around to help him also makes more sense in the movie. Like, especially devoid of all of those other um, horrible things that he does not do in the movie. Right, yeah. But she's also, they make changes to her character. Like, she's an adventurous free spirit who has nothing to lose. Yeah. As opposed to, like, a member of the Canadian (laughs) government who then catches feelings after he saves her from being raped. Yeah. No, it makes a lot more sense in the movie that she's like, all right. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like. (laughs) She's like, I'm not doing anything. She's kind of a drifter as it is and doesn't really, you know, she's, yeah, goes from place to place and that sort of thing. So, yeah, totally works. And he, yes, he's not, he doesn't, he doesn't hit a striker once Mm -hmm. in the movie. Not not a one time. Nary a strike, nary a threat. (laughs) And on that note. In fact, he goes out of his way to be like, or maybe that's what you're about to talk to. But he goes out of his way to be like, I'm just trying to, like, he's like, you need to leave. He's like, I'm just trying to. To help, I don't. I don't know what to do. I don't remember anything. Please leave if you want to. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. And like, yeah, I have to say that I I also like movie Jason better than book Jason. Um, book Jason is often quite unlikable, and even though the book goes to pretty great lengths to th- show that he's not actually an international assassin and all of his supposed kills have been falsified. And I don't think he ever actually kills anyone. Yeah. Maybe he does. I don't remember, but he's still like kind of not that <laughs> great of a dude. <laughs> like he's, he's of his time. Um, and I've discussed his treatment of Marie. Uh, he also put all of those fishermen in the hospital. He also robbed that guy. He also routinely intimidates and threatens people. On the flip side, <laughs> Matt Damon manages to look like a lost puppy, even when he's beating the crap out of someone. Yeah. And it's endearing. No, it's endearing. They definitely gave him a much more sympathetic angle in the movie. Yeah. Like, he's he not only is he... Um, he he has that look of just like always not being sure of what's going on. Yeah, like you said, he's just looking like a lost puppy. 
because uh, he's a young Matt Damon, um, but also just making him giving him that that crisis of conscience earlier yeah. on, which we I don't remember if we find out in later movies whether or not he had ever actually assassinated anybody before that or if that was like his first one. I don't remember if they say in this movie, the guy at the end is like, you planned it out. You it was your idea to do, you know, like all that sort of stuff. But I don't remember if they ever discuss like how long this has been going on or if he's been a secret agent for years and killed a bunch of people. And this was the first one that went, you know, I don't remember. Uh, And I also don't remember if the sequels address that or not. Um, I mean, he's pretty young. He can't have been an assassin for that long. Can't have been for that long. Yeah. But I do, I do wonder. um, Yeah. Yeah. I think that the movie does gain a lot with his character by, like you said, having him have that crisis of conscience much earlier especially in regard to involving marie because he doesn't really have that crisis of conscience until like much later in the book it's like maybe almost 60 70 percent of the way through when they actually start trying to frame her for stuff yeah when he's like oh maybe i shouldn't have gotten you involved in this (laughs) yeah from moment one like yeah dude (laughs) yeah well and it makes sense too yeah especially if you want to make him empathetic because he doesn't know who he is or anything like he he's he he's like i don't know what i don't want to involve you in this like he's just because he doesn't know any of his backstory or anything it's just makes it very clear from moment one that he's kind of just seems like a a normal dude (laughs) like a nice guy who's like and not a not a trademark nice guy just like a (laughs) a legitimately kind of nice guy who's like can't remember anything about his past it's like how you it's much more it's easier to put yourself in that situation. Yeah. Or at least for the most of us who aren't psychopaths or whatever, um, of of the guy who's like, I I don't know what's going on and I'm sorry and I'm don't know what's happening. I don't remember anything, but when people touch me, <laughs> I beat them up. I don't know. <laughs> the movie also had a lot more of the cool, like typical kind of spy stuff that I was expecting with this story. Yeah. Like I liked the scene where they activated all of the different spies. I liked the car chase. Um, all the different fights and him like using makeshift weapons. Mm-hmm. Like all that stuff is fun. Yeah, we do get some more generic not generic, but yeah. Kind of uh, typical tropey, yeah, tropey spy stuff. movie stuff, spy thriller stuff. This isn't something that transferred to the movie, but I just want to mention it because it really bothered me in the book. Uh, so in the book, the CIA starts believing that Bourne as has actually lost his memory because initially he tries to tell Conklin, like, I don't remember anything. And Conklin's like, oh, sure, sure you don't, right. blah, blah, blah. Um, but they start believing him because Marie managed to talk to and convince the right person that Bourne was actually telling the truth. But we never find out what it was she said in order to accomplish that. And I'm really (laughs) bothered by it. (laughs) Yeah, what? She's just like, no, he really... He's the real deal, guys. He's the real deal. He doesn't doesn't remember anything. And they're like... Okay, that checks out. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know what she could say that would make... Then, but like maybe she took a polygraph or something, which also, well, no, by the, by, the polygraphs other, are bullshit. But the anyways. other wild thing, though, is that it seemed to be, and maybe I misread it, but it seemed to be that she accomplished all of this over the phone. Yeah, I, I so I don't I, know. Very want to know, but a very I don't. Compelling person, apparently. Apparently. All right, we've got a few things, and the movie nailed it. As I expected, practically perfect in every way. I really liked the way that the movie depicted him just like knowing how to fight and knowing what to do. Like it was muscle memory. That's Mm -hmm. very similar to how the book portrays it. Uh, We talked about Treadstone being the name of the CIA division. Uh, We talked about Conklin and how he uh, doesn't believe Jason when he tells him that he has no memory. Some of the character names are the same. (laughs) Uh, the premise is the same yeah the they nailed premise, the premise yeah, yeah um so the cover i just realized the cover of this book has giant aviators with a yeah. crack in them is that something in the book no no like not not specifically <laughs> no, it's that just an aesthetically pleasing cover right because so i was like that's not a thing in the movie like he mm-hmm. never wears aviators or anything i was wondering if there was something mentioned in the book no okay all right we've got a few odds and ends before we get to the final verdict
All right. Okay. So I just want, I want your opinion and anyone else's opinion who listens to this. Can a car go down a flight of stairs and still drive? Uh, yes. Are you sure? Yeah. I mean, it's now like guaranteed that it can still drive. No, but like. Could it, is it possible to go down a flight of stairs and still drive? Yes. Especially mm-hmm. cars with certain, constructed certain ways. And and um, obviously the Mini is a very short car. Yeah. So it doesn't, it's not going to bottom out in the same way that like a. That's fair. Okay. You know, yeah. like if you're going down in like a, a giant like sedan or something. Right. The, 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 you're, when you get to the bottom of the stairs, the whole front of the car is going to slam into the ground and stuff. Whereas the Mini is a lot shorter. Like the, it, 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 Long story short, I think it is possible. It's not advisable. It's not something you should do. And it's not something that, <laughs> y- you know, I don't know what the odds are of the car being drivable afterwards, but it's probably not great. Like, it's probably. We here at this film is lit. Do not endorse you driving your car down uh-uh. a flight of stairs. I would say don't do that. Do not do that. Uh-uh. But it's it's definitely doable. Um, I've seen I've seen videos of it, like real yeah. life of people driving downstairs. I also, stuff. I think the most unrealistic thing that happened in this whole movie is that Marie Reed did not get absolutely carsick during that. I was getting carsick watching, watching it. it. Yeah, I would have been barfing everywhere. Yeah, I don't like. Yeah, I don't... Matt Damon would have been like, "Okay, forget it. You can leave." It's funny you say that because you don't get motion sick on like roller coasters, and, no, and to not me that's really. more close. That would be closer to a roller coaster than like being in a car. I mean, I think it would be like a combination of like motion sick and general like anxiety. (laughs) Yeah, the anxiety would be through the roof for sure. Yeah. I do get motion sick sometimes on long car rides. But is that when you're doing things? Not as much as I did when I was little. Is that when you're doing things? Because I used to get car sick I don't I don't get motion sick at all like doing anything, but I used to get car sick if I would like sit in the back and I would like read or like you know play with to- like stuff like that if mm-hmm. i was like not looking at the road yeah that would occasionally make me car sick but i didn't i've never gotten just car sick from like being in a car like regardless of situation i have to be doing something else while in the car i'm just wondering if maybe it was the same or right probably yeah, yeah. that gives yeah that would be I think that's pretty common, like if you're mm-hmm. reading or whatever, to get cars. I cannot read in a car. Within like 30 <laughs> seconds, I get like violently like, ugh, I hate it. Ugh. Not a fan. The only thing I really wanted to talk about was just to kind of get into, we, we, we mentioned it briefly, um, and we talked about it in the prequel episode about like, you know, how... Uh, I can't remember the director's name now. Uh, Lud- no, not Ludlum. Um, that's the author. <laughs> uh, it is with an L, though. It is an L. Um, Lyman, Doug Lyman. Yeah. Uh, he talked about how, like, he... Or no, because he didn't write it. Whoever the writer was talked about how they incorporated some of their political views and this sort of thing, um, and but they tried not to make it too, like... There was some specific line about how he, 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 he made it point not to make his political leanings like super over like he didn't want to feel like it was jamming it down people's throats or whatever but that it still leaked in thematically and that sort of thing and that was one of the things we talked about the prequel was like is there much going on thematically let's pay attention to that i didn't think there was not not like a ton yeah i didn't feel like there was a ton not not anything really unique not anything anything. super unique or and not that it has to be unique because a lot of movies thematically right retreading old themes but um, I mean, the, the main one, the, like the big one, which we did talk about, is about like government sort of and specifically the U.S. government and specifically, specifically the CIA um, doing a bunch of shady shit and like right. going in and destabilizing nations and, and like, you know, nation building and all this sort of stuff and, and doing this this bad thing, which is a very leftist critique of right. the U.S. government. But it's... But it's also, like, it's also kind of a milk toast message because, the, like, none of that is a revelation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not a revelation. I will say that it is at least interesting and cool when you do see a movie that is ostensibly like a spy thriller mm-hmm. that goes out of its way to criticize... The yeah, government that's agencies involved because very often when you have spy thrillers, um, either they use if they're going to have like a corrupt, bad, like government agency doing bad things, they're like a made up agency, like right. in Mission Impossible or whatever. Um, 
I think it's canon. or like so it's something that Marvel does a lot. Yes. It's like one bad person who infiltrated, right? Or something like yeah, that. Yeah, or or it's or it's literally like it turns out, oh, it was Hydra the whole time yeah. and not actually the U.S. government, yeah. like you know that sort of thing. Um, yeah, or it was one bad yeah, apple. Yeah, one bad apple, and all we have to do is get rid of that guy yeah. over there. But the, this movie does at least, I and and it's not super strong. Like I I, I will agree with the, the writer, director, whoever said it that the, the political message isn't super strong, but it's definitely there because at the end of the movie we do get that scene where um, Brian Cox, whatever his character's name is, is sitting in front of some panel at the CIA or whatever, and he goes, yeah, so we shut down Treadstone. That's all taken care of. It's closed. But I do want to mention this new program I got, Blackbriar. I, I mean, and we don't go into any details of what that is, but the implication is that it's the is same that it's thing. Basically, yeah. we shut down one. We're starting up the same thing, doing the exact same thing again. Um, uh, CIA going to CIA. And it's definitely, um, and it makes me wonder, too, because it, I, I don't know if you noticed this or anybody else noticed this. We watched this in, in like Ultra HD, like 4K. Mm -hmm. The scenes that were quote unquote shot in the CIA, like in the cafeteria and that that boardroom, distinctly to me looked like they might have been um, green screened. Hmm. And it made me wonder if because of the messaging of the film, they couldn't film at the actual CIA, like sometimes mm -hmm. for that kind of stuff, like certain, yeah. certain movies and stuff, if they got, if they sign off, if the CIA signs off on the messaging, you They'll can let you film there. in certain places. Yeah. And I'm the wondering, CIA probably did not approve of this. Yeah. I mean, I, I absolutely. The CIA are the bad guys in this movie. Yeah. And I wonder if that's why those shots looked like maybe they were green screened. They're the only ones that look like that in the whole movie. I was like, that kind of looks like they're green screened into that cafeteria. And I'm, but it's funny because it's like you could just nobody knows what the cafeteria yeah, the CIA looks like. You could just go to a cafeteria. But I'm assuming that was supposed to be like the. I don't know. I don't hmm. know. Um, but it was interesting to me, and it made me wonder if the, those things were related at all, or if it was just for other reasons. Um, that they seem to green screen these couple scenes. Uh, but the other the other thing thematically I thought was going on, uh, and a little bit less so, but it's still there a little bit. And I wonder if they'll get into it in, in further movies more. Is about um, uh, trauma and PTSD, and and yeah. specifically that within sort of people with a military background and that sort of thing. It doesn't go into it in the same level and with the same sort of focus that something like last blood did which yeah. was a huge part of last blood and was really it's first blood first sorry first, first blood, blood. <laughs> last blood is the i think the last rambo movie is really bad <laughs> uh from what i've heard but i think there is a little bit there about um you know it's it, the, the yeah. whole movie is predicated on his his sort of uh this ptsd event type there this this it's crisis like, of conscience yeah, he has that traumatic triggers a event traumatic event that triggers um, a, and i i think we talked about briefly in the prequel about them wanting to cut some of the scenes from the farmhouse. Yeah. That the director and Matt Damon like fought really fought hard to, to keep, keep in. in yeah. Um, and I can only imagine since they felt that those were thematically relevant, that that must have been when he was worrying about the kids. Yeah, it was, it, it had to have been. Cause yeah. I, I thought about that as we were finishing up the movie. I was like, yeah. What was the scenes very, that they were? Yeah, it's a very quiet moment. Yeah, um, that's n not that it doesn't fit in the movie, but it's different right. from other yeah. stuff that happens. Um, but it does inform his character. Yeah, and like who he is, and that kind of yeah, that crisis of conscience. And it, and it gives another bullet point. It's not. It it then makes the the moment where he does have that crisis of crisis of conscience uh, that triggers this whole thing where mm -hmm. he sees the kids and he can't kill the guy. It gives another, another moment to sort of ground that and make that a character trait as opposed to just a right. thing that happened. That right. Time. And I think there is something there. I think it's underdeveloped, I, but yeah, I, I agree. think it's there is something there uh, with, with messaging about like when certain people are asked to, bury their empathy yeah yeah i agree i yeah i do think and that like what that can result in mm -hmm, absolutely I, I i agree that i do think it was a little underdeveloped i think that they undercooked some of the 
I think there's a lot of a lot, there was more meat to the bones of this movie, or uh, there could have been more meat on the bones of this movie. Like it's it's mm-hmm. a it's a good movie, it's a fun movie, and it has some things to say, but it's it's not it doesn't go hard enough. I think yeah, if it, it would I have agree. been it would have been a lot more interesting of a film, and I think Roger Ebert wouldn't have said it was pointless or whatever. That <laughs> like he like he what did he call it like. Um, satisfactory like but pointless. pointless fun or something like no, that. No, it was it was much more. Uh, was it? it was like oh, he said, like uh, it was satisfactory or satisfactory filmmaking, but meaningless or something like yeah. something like that. I can't remember the exact quote, but um, because I, I can't say that I necessarily disagree with how with the way that the movie kind of went at its its most important themes and it just didn't mm-hmm. hit them hard enough and mm-hmm. it could have yeah but yeah that was okay that was all i wanted to talk about <laughs> uh, i just want to talk about what was going on thematically and what wasn't all right then that means it's time for the final verdict now uh, are you ready for your sentence sentence but there must be a verdict first sentence first Verdict afterwards. Before we get to the final verdict, we wanted to remind you that you can do us a giant favor by heading over to patreon.com slash this film is lit. Support us over there for two, five, or fifteen dollars a month. You get access to different things at each level. Highly recommend the five dollars or up level because you get access to our bonus content, including our most recent bonus episode, which was a discussion of both uh, outbreak and contagion. Mm-hmm. Uh, two pandemic, well, one epidemic and one pandemic movie uh, as we're rounding out this pandemic, at least in the U.S., seemingly, hopefully. Actually, it's going to become endemic. I just saw an article the other day saying that it would, between the vaccine hesitancy and other stuff that it's going to become endemic and we're not going to be able to get rid of it. So hooray. Yay. Anyways, uh, we talked about uh, Outbreak and Contagion and well, what they got right, what they got wrong and uh, how they were as films. So you can go check that out over at patreon.com slash this film is lit uh, $15 level. You get access to priority recommendations, which is why we're doing The Born Identity. That was a patron request from... Kelly Napier. Kelly, thank you for uh, reaching out and asking us to do The Born Identity. I didn't have to read it, so thank you, at least for me. <laughs> I it's, it's like 900 pages. No, it's 500 it's, pages. It's almost 550. It's 550 pages, but it's, it's, it's smaller. Yeah, it's, I've, I've got the mass market paper back here. Yeah. It's almost 550 pages, and the print is very small. Yeah, if that was like a, a, a Harry Potter-style published, that would be like a 900-pager probably, but... <laughs> Like like in the same yeah. sort of formatting. Uh, but if you want us uh, to talk about a movie slash book that you really like, support us for 15 bucks a month, and it'll move way up the list. You can also do us a giant favor by heading over to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or Goodreads. Follow us there. Uh, like us. Not subscribe. Follow us. Uh, we post all kinds of stuff there. Uh, most importantly, the thing that interests us the most that we would like you to go to those platforms for is every Friday after a main episode, we post a reaction thread where we get your feedback. Uh, and then on the prequel episode, we talk about what you felt about the book or the movie, uh, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you thought it got wrong or right. Anything you felt, um, if you hated whatever, doesn't matter. Just tell <laughs> us what you thought about, uh, whatever we're talking about that week. And we will discuss it on the prequel episode. Katie, it's now time for the final verdict. I always feel really, really bad when I don't like the patron requests. I always feel really, really bad. People have different tastes, all right? Yeah. But I I just didn't enjoy this book. No. It was dated in a way that I didn't care for. I felt that there was a lot of extra repetitive stuff that could have been edited down. And I didn't think that there was a genre other than romantic comedies in which the refusal to communicate trope would make me want to absolutely scream. But here it was in a spy story. And while I understand the book's various conceits for that lack of communication, by page 500, it was feeling pretty old. It's fair. But now hang on a minute, because <laughs> the movie is not getting off completely scot-free either. Both mediums, I thought, shared a couple of issues. One of issue, one of those issues was kind of similar, but also opposite. The book, I felt, had too much going on. Too many characters to keep track of, too many plot twists, too much mystery, intrigue building without enough breadcrumbs for the reader. 
I struggled pretty consistently throughout to understand what it was that I was supposed to be gleaning from some of the conversations that happened during the narrative because I just felt that I didn't know enough yet to know what I was supposed to get from them. The movie, like I said, has kind of the opposite problem. Not enough going on. A lot of it was fun, but I did feel like we just jumped from one big scene to the next big scene without a lot of connective background tissue to hold those set pieces together. I also felt that both mediums suffered from a lack of a satisfying ending. And I get that both are setting up for sequels, but as we've discussed here before, even if you're setting up for another installment, you still need to provide a satisfying conclusion. The movie I felt wrapped up too easily, while the book I felt left too many loose threads still dangling in the air. Now, all of that said, I did enjoy watching the movie more than I enjoyed reading the book. So on that count, I'm going to give this one to the movie, but just by a hair. All right. Um, I would only slightly disagree in the sense that I really like the movie ending. I think it's actually like a perfect ending, kind of. Like I love uh, the the sort of implication that we talked about of the just the, the churning machine of the CIA continuing mm-hmm. on with the next exactly identical go fuck with other countries program. Um, but at the same time, we still get born getting a you know seemingly happy ending, getting to go live out his days in Greece with his pretty German girlfriend, like. I don't know. I, 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 I like the ending. Um, I guess it does wrap up a little easy in the sense of like, we don't go into any details about like, did they just stop looking for him? Like, well, yeah. And again, there's, there's some sequel implications there, yeah. I guess. But, but if you don't think about it too hard, if you think like, Oh, they just, they, <laughs> they burned the book and they moved on and you just watched like, this is the only story. I think the movie's ending kind of works. Um, all right, Katie, what do we got coming up next? Coming up next, we have a book whose title I'm not 100% sure how to pronounce, so bear with me. I'll ask Aaron. I'll get a, a I'll message Aaron. Be like, we will this? be talking about Radio Free Albemuth. Yep. Albemuth. 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 One of those, probably. Uh, it's a book by Philip K. Dick, and it is a 2010 film. This is one that I've never heard of either. I Yeah. I have I, never, I had never heard of it. Um. Yeah, I never heard of the book or the movie, and I'm really interested to see what the heck it is because knowing Philip K. Dick, it'll be it'll be interesting. Like it'll definitely be mm-hmm. interesting. I'm just wondering like where it fits in his oeuvre. <laughs> like what kind of Philip K. Dick is this? We'll find is this, out. Like, psychedelic weird Philip K. Dick, or is this like um, more grounded? Like you know, uh, yeah. What's the it's time cop one? Not time cop. Uh, <laughs> Where they can predict the future. Oh, yeah. What was that called? We did it on here. Minority Report. Yeah. <laughs> like, Minority Report's a little more like grounded normal science fiction, where Scanner Darkly's a little more like psychedelic, trippy. I'm wondering, and, and um, I'm sure there are ones that are even more further on each side of the spectrum than that. I'm, I'm like three chapters into this book, and based on the prologue, I think it might be a little more psychedelic, trippy, but we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. We'll find out. We'll find out. We'll find out at least a little bit about it on the next prequel episode in one week's time. And in two weeks time, we're talking about radio free album youth. I'm going to go with that pronunciation. Album youth. Oh, and also Philip K. Dick is in the book as a character. Yes, yeah, so definitely we'll, later. Let, uh, let that pique your interest. Philip K. Dick, I feel like <laughs> he, he wrote, he wrote himself into the book. Presumably. Fantastic. Until that time, guys, <laughs> Until that time, guys, gals, non-binary, everybody else. Keep reading books. Keep watching movies. And and keep keep being being awesome. awesome.